So uh, thank you, everyone. I know this is the, uh, the last lecture. A lot of you are probably getting tired. So I'll try to explain this in a way that hopefully makes sense to a lot of you. And of course, if you have any questions, feel, uh, feel free to uh, uh, send staff private messages because they've been doing an awesome job so far. Shout out to all the staff. And uh, all right, let's get going. So uh, my lecture is going to be on the Chinese remainder theorem, which is uh, an integral part of the branch of mathematics known as modular arithmetic. I know uh, Su Hyuk, uh, David did uh, a lot of modular arithmetic in his lecture, but my lecture is going to kind of expand upon some of the key things that we, uh, we learned in his lecture, because my lecture is going to be focusing on the efficiency that modular arithmetic provides uh, problem solvers, especially competi uh, competitive problem solvers in trying to solve problems in the least amount of time possible. And uh, as you will be able to see during this lecture, our goal will almost always be to solve seemingly impossible problems in you know, an accomplishable amount of time without resorting to computing or um, uh, uh, the least amount of brute force calculation possible. And uh, throughout this lecture, I also hope to kind of decipher modular notation for you guys, because this is big part of what uh, makes modular arithmetic um, really difficult for a lot of newcomers is the notation is very difficult. And then finally, um, throughout this lecture, I will also be using a variety of proofs, mostly because um, we are going to be proving the Chinese remainder theorem today, because I think that, you know, it's, it's generally good practice to prove a theorem before you use it for the first time. All right, so uh, this is just a refresher. What is modular arithmetic? So it's also known as clock arithmetic, as David, uh, as David kind of covered during his lecture. And um, the easiest way to think about modular arithmetic from my point of view is it's basically a representation of numerical division. In traditional numerical division, you have a dividend, you have a divisor which divides that dividend, uh, and then you have a quotient, which is the result of the operation, and then you have the remainder. Now, when you translate that into modular arithmetic terms, uh, what it turns out is that the quotient basically gets eliminated from the equation, and you instead have the dividend, which is congruent to the divisor, um, oh, sorry, that's wrong, uh, which is congruent to the remainder uh, mod, uh, mod divisor. So um, what that means is that basically the quotient no longer matters. You can essentially have multiple different quotients uh, that satisfy this modular equation, which is why a lot of modular expressions often have infinite solutions in real life. Now, this is the official notation for you know, this kind of, uh, this congruence in modular form where X is congruent to A mod K, uh, this is if and only if. So this means that um, bo essentially both conditions on uh, the side of this, uh, on either side of this expression are equivalent in all forms. So X is congruent to A mod K if and only if uh, X equals NK plus A, where X, A, K, and N are all members of the integer set Z. So all of them are integers. And uh, of course, A has to be within uh, the boundary of uh, K minus K to K because otherwise A wouldn't be considered a proper remainder. Now, usually we choose to express A uh, in positive form, but sometimes it is more advantageous to express it in negative form as you will be seeing throughout the lecture. And uh, continuing on kind of our refresher course, we have properties of modular arithmetic, which David again covered during his lecture. Very briefly, um, basically using the above expression, if we go back, where we express uh, x, uh, x is nk plus a, or in this case, a is ck plus x and b is dk plus y, we can basically very briefly prove that addition carries over in modular arithmetic the way we would expect it to carry over in real life. So when you do a plus b in modular arithmetic, uh, in mod k, you have a mod k plus b mod k, and the whole of which uh, is again put through mod k. So essentially what this means is that you can calculate the results of individual numbers in mod k and then add them together and the result will still hold true in mod k, which of course is very natural. Um, and then we have multiplication. And uh, here again, it's much the same story where you can basically multiply a times b in mod k and you will be able to separate this result into its constituent parts a mod k and b mod k and then have uh, and then have uh, these two multi results multiplied together uh, and uh, put back through mod k and the reason for this is that when you have ck plus x and dk plus y multiplied within mod k you have you know you, you have a polynomial where if you sort by 
uh, if you sort by order of k, you essentially end up with only the last term because all the others will obviously be divisible by k. You have so you have x y left over, which then gives you x y mod k, which happens to be the result of a mod k and b mod k multiplied together. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? All right, um, good to know. Um, so this is basically kind of you know the basic properties. And it's really important that we understand these because um, we're going to be using these nonstop throughout the remainder of the lecture. So um, a more tricky concept is known as modular exponentiation. And that's basically how exponents work inside of modular arithmetic. And again, we see that um, if you do a to the power of b uh, in mod k, um, we, we are allowed to indeed separate the exponent from its base. So we can uh, apply mod k to the base, which in this case is a, before having the exponent b go on the expression. Um, and this works because if you say that a is ck plus x in mod k, um, you can use binomial expansion to expand the expression ck plus x to the power of b. And if you expand this expression in its entirety, again, you see that there are factors of k throughout the equation, except for the last term, which is x to the power of b. So in the end, all of these k terms get eliminated because they're already divisible by k. Remember, modular arithmetic is always a representation of division. If something is divisible uh, by, uh, by the modular base, then it doesn't count as part of the expression because all we are looking for is the remainder. So since the, since the remainder is x to the power of b, we end up with x to the power of b in mod k, which of course is what we would have gotten if we had simply applied mod k to the base a. Now what this allows us to do in essence is uh, transform uh, modular bases in a very, uh, tr transform exponential bases in modular arithmetic. Uh, although this operation is very limited, we can use this, uh, use this fact to um, basically simplify a lot of very seemingly complicated uh, expressions like seven to the power of 500 in mod 50. Now, um, obviously, you know, the, the, the sort of caveman mathematical way to do this would be to calculate the number seven to the power of 500, and then to put that through mod 50 by dividing it by 50. Um, but not only would that break your computer, it would also break your brain. So instead of doing that, we can use this, uh, the newfound tools that we have um, to basically ex express seven to the power of 500 as 49 to the power of 250. And we can use the trick uh, 49 equals 50 minus one to essentially express 49 as minus one mod 50. And now once we express 49 as minus one mod 50, we can use the exponentiation above to again, run our calculation through mod, uh, the binomial expansion. And again, we see factors of 50 throughout, which gives us minus one to the power of 200, uh, 250 in mod 50. And since this exponent is an even number, uh, our final answer will be one. Which then gives us, uh, which then allows us to find that seven, uh, seven to the power of five hundred is one in mod fifty. Now we have to note here that this only works because of the quirk that forty nine is fifty minus one. For example, if we had this in mod, I don't know, if we had this in mod fifty two, for example, uh, the result would be a lot more difficult because we wouldn't have such a clean number. In fact, I'm pretty sure if this were in mod fifty two, this calculation would be basically impossible. So again, here we see that. Yes, we have achieved a, an astounding level of efficiency, but also that this efficiency is very limited because we need this modular base, this modular base of 50 to be a particular number in order for us to be able to finagle this expression um, in a way such that we are able to simplify it relatively quickly. Um, now, before we go into the Chinese remainder theorem, another concept we have to cover is the idea of a multiplicative inverse. And uh, I know David covered this during his lecture, but let's go over it again. And basically, a multiplicative inverse is defined as y is congruent to x, uh, the y is congruent to the inverse of x mod k. So y is the inverse of x in mod k, where x times y, so the multiplicative inverse of k, uh, the multiplicative inverse of x in mod k, Sorry. So that would be x uh, multiplied by y is congruent to one in mod k. So an example of this, for example, would be um, 30, uh, 37 and three. These two numbers are inverses of each other in mod 110 because 37 times three is 111. So it's 111, which means that 
37 times three is one in mod uh, 110, which means that these two numbers are inverses of each other because the result of their multiplication is one in mod, uh, in mod 110. Now, as you can see from this example, again, we have a problem that it's very hard to solve for inverses in real life due to the exhaustive nature of the calculations needed to identify them. Um, for example, if we didn't know the fact that 37 times 3 would be 111, we would need to exhaustively calculate all of the multiplications up to 37 before we would find a number that would be an inverse of 3 um, in mod 110. And as you can see, as the modular bases get bigger, or uh, you find it harder to identify numbers that give you this specific result, it becomes very, very difficult to calculate this by hand. And remember, we're trying to solve such problems in a competitive setting. So, uh, well, not necessarily competitive setting, but an efficient setting. So in order for us to achieve this sort of efficiency without having to resort to, uh, resort to a computer, um, you know, we, we need not only certain conditions, but we also need to resort to a certain amount of caveman mathematics. So with that said, um, let's go to the Chinese remainder theorem. And the, rem the remainder theorem is actually very simple. And it's the idea that given co-prime integers, co-prime where they share no prime factors other than the one. Um, uh, so given co-prime integers P and Q, uh, the system of integers X is congruent to A in mod P and X is congruent to B in mod Q has exactly one distinct solution. X is congruent to n in mod pq. Now, in layman's terms, what this means is that if you have a certain number x that is, uh, that is expressible in some number in mod p and some number in mod q, and if you have these expressions in mod p and mod q, you will then be able to combine these two expressions into a new expression, that allow, uh, a new expression which expresses x in mod pq. Uh, now, this should remind you of something. And to me, it reminds me of almost a system of equations, right? This is basically a modular system of equations where we have two equations in mod P and mod Q that are in different bases. And we can combine those into, uh, uh, into a solution that's in mod PQ. Now, um, before we you know, explore the, the, rep the repercussions of this theorem, let's first go ahead and start proving it. So. In order for us to kind of prove that this uh, solution in mod PQ that we postulate exists does indeed exist, we have to first prove that this solution exists. So first of all, let's go ahead and define uh, C as the multiplicative inverse of P in mod Q and D as the multiplicative inverse of Q in mod P. Now, um, stay, stay with me because this might become a little bit complicated, but basically we can use these new terms to construct and verify a valid solution to, these, to this equation, which will then allow us to assume that this solution exists because we have uh, just proved that through proof by construction. Now, um, I am going to refer to uh, Lynn here, who's, uh, who had an article on this uh, on the Stanford University website. It's in my references, so feel free to check it out. But uh, as given by Lynn, the solution is uh, Y is congruent to AQD plus BQC in mod PQ. Um, and basically what this tells us is that um, we multiply all of these different variables. And if you input um, this solution into both equations, you get, uh, for example, if you go to the first equation, sorry, let me go back to the, oh, I can't. Okay, for some reason, I seem to have trouble going back. But uh, so basically if you go into Y, uh, y in mod P, you basically input this expression into mod P, which makes sense. And then because BPC is divisible by P, you, have, you simply have AQD in mod P, uh, given that again, P divides BPC. However, uh, since QD in mod P is equal to one, because remember, um, D is defined as the multiplicative inverse of Q in mod P, since QD is equal to one, you simply get A times one in mod P, which gives you A mod P, which of course satisfies the equation, the first equation that we outlined above in the system of equations. Now, using a similar procedure, we can also deduce that if you put the same expression through mod Q, you get AQD plus BP BPC in mod Q, uh, which then gives you just BPC in mod Q because AQD is divisible by Q, uh, which then gives you B in mod Q, given that again, we have set this expression up so that PC in mod Q is equal to one because again, P and C are inverses in mod Q. Um, now, 
what that allows us to assert is that this solution, this solution, this very complicated solution that we have just created essentially fulfills the requirements of both equations, which then allows us to assert that this is a valid solution to this equation, uh, which means that uh, because it is a valid solution to this equation, uh, we have created the solution through proof by construction. Does anyone have any questions? Staff, does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to the second step because remember, uh, what we've done just now is we've proved that this solution exists. And it's not really enough to prove that this solution exists because technically there could be a lot of solutions like this that exist. And in order to avoid that, we have to prove that this is a singular solution. So the proof of singularity works as follows. And this is, again, pretty brief, but it should be easier to understand than the last part. Now, assuming that both X and Y are distinct solutions uh, in mod PQ of the above system, uh, we can essentially say that since X, um, that X and Y should both equal A in mod P, and equal B in mod Q, it follows that X and Y should both, uh, X and Y should both equal the same thing in mod PQ, given that P and Q are co-prime. However, since, since X and Y uh, have to be distinct solutions, this is obviously a contradiction. Therefore, we can assert that only one solution exists uh, because again, we assumed that we would have two distinct solutions in mod PQ, uh, we ran that assumption through to the very end and it turned out to contradict itself, which obviously means that then we must only have one solution. Uh, and finally, we can also use, uh, okay, so far, okay, let me, let's pause to this point. Uh, so far, we have basically proven that the version of the Chinese remainder theorem we have now uh, is true, that if we have two different systems of equations with two different modular bases, we will be able to synthesize both of them uh, into the form uh, into the form mod PQ, and that we will only have one solution that holds true for this system of equations. Now, what we can also do is we can use proof by induction to generalize uh, this theorem and expand it to basically have a system of n equations. So this is the theorem on the left. If you see, we're basically going to have n different equations in n different modular bases. And if you take these n different modular bases, you will be able to synthesize them uh, into a form mod the, the product of all of the different modular bases uh, and a certain number. And again, this solution will be singular. Now, how do we know this? Uh, we know this because it's in essence, um, I know this, um, uh, this inductive proof is very complicated. So let me try and explain it in a way that may, uh, might be a little bit more simple. So in essence, let's go ahead and take these two uh, these two first modular expressions. X is congruent to A1 in mod P1, and X is congruent to A2 in mod P2. Now, we already know that because we proved the theorem from before, that we can synthesize these two into a, into a single uh, modular equation that will be presented in the form mod P1, P2, the product of both of those modular bases. But since um, P1 through Pn are all co-prime, we can essentially assert that because our new equation, the one that we just created in mod P1, P2, will again fulfill the requirements of our theorem with the next equation, which will presumably in mod, uh, be in mod P3, we can combine those two equations into, uh, into the form mod P1, P2, P3. Because again, P1, P2, and P3 will be co-prime. And we can repeat this process you know, any number of times given that all of these different modular bases will be co-prime. Um, uh, to essentially create one singular expression that will express the solution X in uh, mod P1, P2 through to Pn. And obviously this is an official inductive proof, so this is very complicated, but I hope uh, me explaining this in verbal form has made it a little bit more easier to understand. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, uh, moving on. So uh, with that said, let's go ahead and do a sample problem that should be relatively simple, nothing involving the, you know, the more complex versions of the theorem that I just showed you. This is you know, two modular equations, and uh, I'm asking you to find x where the, x where the, uh, the answer y will be x in mod 20. So uh, how about we take around uh, maybe five to 10 minutes uh, to find the answer to this question. 
and staff, if we have answers, please uh, pass them along if possible. Okay. All right, so we have one answer from number 65, but uh, let's go ahead and wait for a couple of more people. Now keep in mind because the modular bases here are very, you know, they're very small. Um, we should be able to find the answer in mod 20 relatively easily just by listing the different numbers that these two expressions would be possible for. All right. All right, we have a couple of more answers. Uh, numbers 100, uh, 155 and 154. Good, 33, uh, 34. All right, okay. It seems like people are, you know, figuring this out. So, so the answer was 17. Um, congratulations to those of you who got it right. Um, but let me go ahead and explain this really briefly. So in essence, what we're doing is we're listing all of the possibilities in mod 20 for each equation. So if you look at the first equation, if you have uh, X equals one mod four, we know that in mod 20, that could turn out to be either one, five, nine, 13, or 17. All of these possibilities will give you one in mod four because 20 is obviously um, uh, four, uh, 20 is obviously divisible by four. So all you need to do is add for each time until you get past the modular base of 20. And then you have, uh, and then you can do a similar approach with X equals two, uh, two in mod five, where you add five each time. So you go two, seven, seven uh, 12 and 17. And here we see that there is, a, uh, there is a common number that works for both equations and that's 17, which should then indicate that X will be 17 in mod 20. Now keep in mind, this doesn't give us a single answer. This gives us you know, an infinite number of answers, um, but all of which, which satisfy the equation X equal, X is congruent to 17 in mod 20. For example, we could have 17, we could have 37, we could have 57, we could have a lot of different numbers. But what is important is that we managed to synthesize these two expressions into a cohesive form, uh, the form of x is congruent to 17 mod 20. Now, let's go ahead and do a recap. Um, remember, at the beginning of this lecture, I said that our goal would be to solve problems in an efficient manner. And um, what did we exactly do just now? We proved that the solution y exists, the, the solution to this modular system of equations exists and we can apply it to, you know, technically an infinitely large system of equations. But what is a problem is that this doesn't really give us, um, you know, the core goal of efficiency because it's very difficult to actually find the solution. Remember, we did have a form, uh, a formula for the solution, AQD plus BQ, uh, AQD plus BPC, but um, because Q, because C and D are in inverse form, it's, very difficult and often even impossible to find these inverses by hand to then give us our actual solution. And the alternative approach is, of course, what we did just now, which is to run through all of the different numbers in the modular, uh, all of the num different numbers that are possible in the modular base. But that also requires that we do a lot of, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of brute force mathematics and kind of bash out all of the different numbers. Um, so, so far, you know, we have successfully identified that this theorem works, but we're not sure how, you know, efficient this approach is. And again, um, even though we can theoretically solve these systems of equations, it doesn't actually give us a lot of benefits in terms of efficiency. And again, we did avoid having to continue these calculations past the initial interval of 20, because if we didn't know that, um, if we didn't know that this equation could be synthesized to the form of mod 20, we would have to do multiple you would, we would have to do multiple series of calculations well past 20 before we could identify that, hey, 17 works for this equation, 37 works, 57 works, hey, our solution must be in mod 20. Instead, we managed to kind of jump that, jumpstart that approach by saying that the solution will be in mod 20. But is this really the maximum amount of potential efficiency we can derive from this approach? So, um, Another way we can use this Chinese remainder theorem is using it to change modular bases. Now, keep in mind that when you have gigantic modular bases, 
the, the core problem is our brute force approach to checking all of the numbers doesn't work anymore because the bases will be so big that checking all of the numbers will take ages and ages. So instead of doing that, what we can do is we can simplify the modular bases. So here, if you look at uh, our first theorem, our first mini theorem over here, we say that if X is congruent to K and mod P and Q divides P, then X will also be congruent to, uh, uh, congruent, uh, then, then X will also be uh, congruent to K and mod Q. Now, what this means is that if you have a gigantic modular base and you don't want to work with this gigantic modular base, you can essentially substitute this gigantic modular base with one of its factors. For example, if I had a modular base that was, I don't know, 3,300, and I didn't want to work with the number 3,300 because that's massive, I could es uh, essentially substitute it for the number 33. Now, obviously that reduces, uh, that, that generalizes the equation a lot more. It's not a complete substitute uh, remember, this is an if-then relationship, not an if and only if relationship. And it's very important to make this, make this distinction, but it still tells us that any solution which satisfies, uh, you know, for example, K mod 3300 must also satisfy K mod 33 because um, 33 is a divisor, uh, is a divisor of 3300. Okay, oh, sorry, okay. And um, the next mini equation we have is that if N is the least common multiple, the least common multiple of P and Q, then we can separate the expression X is congruent to K and mod N into its constituents part, uh, into its constituent parts, X is congruent to K and mod P and X is congruent to K and mod Q. And the reason for this is basically an application of the Chinese remainder theorem, where normally we would have needed for these numbers, P and Q to be co-prime, but even if they're not co-prime, if n is their least common multiple, then we can still express x as a i n plus k, where i is a, uh, is a member of the set of integers, which satisfies both equations because n is divisible by both p and q. So using these two theorems, we can essentially apl uh, apply not only our initial version of the central uh, uh, of the uh, Chinese remainder theorem, but also use these two applications of it to change a lot about the initial modular, uh, the initial modular equations we might get from, you know, a particularly complex problem. We can now change the bases. We can now change, um, you know, the, uh, the modular exponent. We can change a lot of things. So, using all of these tools at our disposal, let's try and uh, let's go ahead and try to solve this problem now, uh, because this is basically a modified version of uh, a problem that was, I believe, in the 2018 uh, Amy. Um, so I don't anticipate that we'll get we'll be getting a lot of answers, but go ahead and use the tools that we should have acquired today to try and solve this problem in maybe the next 15 to 20 minutes. And again, if you have answers, please send them to staff. So uh, I might be able to check them out. Sorry. Um, okay. No, number 151. Um, uh, well, okay. That, that, okay, that should have been a, there is a small error with this problem where um, technically if N is zero, the equation is true. But um, let's go ahead and alter the problem to say the smallest non-zero integer n. Yes, obviously, obviously, if n is zero, this problem, you know, it satisfies the equation. But again, that that's a trivial answer. It's stupid. So let's go ahead and find, you know, an answer that isn't stupid.
I think um, we'll probably have until about uh, 11, uh, 1240 or 1245. So um, take your time. Uh, number 18, this is just a reminder that, um, yes, although zero works uh, in the way that the problem is stated, the answer is trivial, so we want a different answer. Um, number 154, uh, unfortunately, um, that is incorrect. We have a staff member who has the answer though.
Um, 151, uh, the answer is a lot bigger than the number you're looking for. Okay, um, it looks like we have one answer from staff uh, and it is 1240, so I will go ahead and move on. Um, but don't worry if you found this problem impossible because um, I also found this problem impossible when I first looked at it. Um, it's a very, very difficult problem. And um, the first thing we notice here is that, you know, our traditional caveman mathematics approach doesn't work. Like, if you, I mean, aside from the trivial answer of zero, which obviously exists because of an inaccuracy in the way the problem is written, my apologies. Um, if you wanted to find an answer larger than zero and just went, uh, you know, you started with n equals one and then you went to n equals two and then you went, went to n equals three, because n is an exponent, you would quickly find that the numbers would start exploding. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think the, the highest number that an internet calculator can uh, process is n equals 50. And then at, after that, you can't even use the calculator anymore. So, um, right. So, you know, you would have to be a madman to go ahead and, uh, you, you, you would have to be a madman to use, uh, you, you know, use the caveman mathematics approach and go n equals one, n equals two, et cetera. Okay. So, um, oh, Professor Kwan also says n equals zero. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, zero is trivial. Anyway, um, so when you, um, okay, so in order to solve this problem, the first thing we notice is that 77 to the uh, 77 squared is a gigantic number. And it is way too big of a number to be able to, you know, to be able for us to handle efficiently. So uh, using the second mini theorem we had, let's go back to the second mini theorem, which was this. Uh, if n equals the least common multiple of p and q, we can go x is congruent to k equals mod n, if and only if x is congruent to basically k uh, k in mod p and q. Okay, so let's go down. Oh, no. Okay. So uh, because here we can separate 77 squared into 7 squared and 11 squared, we can basically say, oh, sorry. We can basically say that um, the above condition, the first condition where um, three to the power of n has to be congruent to one in mod uh, one in mod seven, 77 squared is the same as three to the power of n is congruent to one in mod seven squared and mod 11 squared. Now, what we can do is we can split these two equations up because seven squared is what, 49 and 11 squared is 121. So those are perfectly manageable numbers uh, where 77 squared is massive. So what we can do is we can split each equation up and see which values of three to the power of n result in a valid equation, which should allow us to hopefully identify a pattern. Now, what allows us to uh, identify this pattern is the fact that um, we're, at, we're looking for uh, three to the power of n, which results in one mod whatever. And that's important because the smallest correct n value will basically mark an, an infinitely repeating cycle. And we can know this without having to go through this cycle because the smallest integer n prime, for example, which satisfies this equation will allow us to say that uh, three, you know, th three to the power of n prime to the power of whatever. So um, w when you have, you know, k n prime where k is an integer, you can say that's uh, the uh, you know three to the power of n prime to the power of k, which then through modular exponentiation uh, through modular exponentiation allows us to conclude that that's simply one to the power of k in mod seventy seven squared or eleven squared or seven squared, which then allows us to say that it's just congruent to one, which then means that it also satisfies the equation, which then allows us to say that you know all we need to do is find uh, find the smallest integer n prime in both cases 7 squared and 11 squared and we will have our you know our least uh, our smallest possible integer so the first criterion was again that uh, 3 to the power of n needs to be congruent to 1 uh, mod 121 so we can uh, we can essentially do you know a simplified version of the listing approach to solve this criteria this particular criterion so if you list all, you know, you know, the, the most commonly listed 
three to the power of n's. You go n is one, uh, three to the power of n must be three. Then you have nine, then you have 27, then you have 81, 243, 729, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you operate uh, mod 121 on all of them. And immediately you find that 243 mod 121 is one, which, uh, you know, and as we, as we have seen, that should lead us to an infinite cycle. And it does, because when you go to the next, you know, so this is the, what, the fifth, uh, this is the fifth power of three. So this is three to the power of five. If you go to three to the power of 10, which is uh, 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 59,049, uh, when you apply that in mod 121, you also get one, which means that this is again an infinite, uh, infinitely repeating cycle with length, uh, with length five, which then allows us to conclude that since the equation holds for every fifth term, we can say that n must be divisible by five because those are the only cases where this first criterion is true, which means that n, you know, we still don't know what n is, but it must be divisible by five. Now. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the second criteria where we try to use the same listing approach because again, the listing approach requires uh, the least brain power and the most handwork, but definitely the least brain power. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so again, we go through all of the different lists of three to the power of n. We go three, nine, 27, 81, et cetera. And uh, we apply mod 49 to all of them. And uh, it turns out we don't get, we don't, ever really get um, you know, a clean sort of a pretty, a, a pretty number. We don't get one. And if we don't get one, you know, we're still just kind of wandering around you know, one through 49 without ever getting a number, which means that you know, we're really getting nowhere with this listing idea. So instead, what we have to do is use the, uh, use, you know, the base reducing techniques and the applications of the Chinese remitted theorem that we learned to simplify the calculation a lot more. So, First of all, what we can observe is that if you go three to the power of six, you get 43. Uh, now 43 is important because 43 mod seven is one. Um, and, and that's important because since we know that three to the power of six in mod 49 is 43, uh, we then know that three to the power of six in mod seven must be one because three to the power of six in mod 49 is 43. And uh, uh, again, we're using the first theorem we know that we can apply mod 49 to mod seven, as long as we don't say that those are, uh, you, know, you know, those those are the exact same conditions. This condition is part of three to the power of six is mod 49. So we know that three to the power of uh, six mod seven is now one. Now that allows us to establish that n must be a multiple of six, given that, again, we just established this. And um, what that implies is that you know, it has to be a multiple of six because only a multiple of six will allow us to get a, a result of one in mod seven. And of course, three to the power of anything mod seven equals one is a precondition for that same number n to yield one in mod 49, uh, as we have seen before in the first theorem. So that essentially allows us to express three to the power of six uh, in mod 49 is a for some integer a. Okay. And now what we can say is that when you apply three to the power of n in mod 49, because we know that n must be divisible by six, we can say that n equals six k, where k is an integer. And we say that uh, three, to the, uh, three to the power of n mod 49 equals three to the power of six k in mod 49, which then allows us to use modular exponen uh, exponentiation, where you put the mod 49 into the, uh, you know, into the exponent. So you have three to the power of six in mod 49 to the power of k. Now we know that three to the power of six in mod 49 will be seven a plus one because we know that three to the mod, uh, power of six mod 49 is obviously, uh, uh, you know, is obviously 43, but here we say that uh, it's a just to, just to illustrate the point. So since we know that it's seven a plus one to the power of K and that needs to equal one in mod 49, all we need to do is find the first integer k that allows us to happen, and then we will have our least, uh, our least possible value n, uh, which will simply be 6k. Now, using uh, modular exponentiation, or in this case, the uh, binomial distribution, it's very easy to determine that, again, um, you have all of these different terms, but all of them will contain uh, a factor of 49, except for the last two terms, which is a k combination 1 times 7a and k combination 0 times 1 which turns out to be 7ka plus one, right? Now, it is important to note that we want this result to equal one in mod 49, which then means that 7ka must somehow be divisible by 49. 
And in order to do that, we need to have 7k equals zero in mod 49 is our modular way of expressing this. From here, it's not very difficult to see that the least, uh, the smallest k value is seven, uh, simply because, you know, if you, unless k is zero, which again, we have established as trivial, if you have k is one, k is two, all of these different numbers will give you multiples of seven, but not, you know, uh, ones that are divisible by 49. Since 49 is seven times seven, uh, you want k to be seven or multiples of seven, which indicates that the smallest n value must then be six times seven is 42. Uh, which then allows us to assert that all multiples of 42 will also then result in the same value of one, because again, we established that uh, using the n, n prime example, uh, it's an infinitely repeating cycle. Therefore, we say that n uh, uh, must be divisible by 42. And since uh, in the first criterion, we established that n must be divisible by five. So since 42 and five are co-prime, we can say that the smallest n is the uh, is the least common multiple of the two, which in this case is you know their product. So that would be two hundred and ten. So as you can see, this is a pretty big number. If we had tried to do the caveman mathematical approach with this problem, we would probably have died of you know we would probably have died before we would ever have gotten the answer to this. So um, you know this is a really good example of the kind of efficiency that modular arithmetic gives you, where you encounter this you know, this problem that looks so outlandishly impossible and you're, you know, you can use these different tips and tricks that you have that this branch of mathematics provides you to solve this problem in a reasonable amount of time. So um, in conclusion, again, we see a huge improvement of efficiency if these techniques are used correctly. And that obviously has gigantic real life applications from, for example, you know, efficiently distributing vaccines to a lot of people. Obviously that's a very pertinent issue right now. And obviously that has, it also has massive implications for uh, computing because you obviously want efficiency in computing because um, that obviously, you know, minimizes the amount of memory and the RAM you have to use. And uh, as uh, David covered in his own lecture, it's also very, uh, very effective in cryptography where uh, in cryptography, what you often want to do is create, uh, create basically, the least efficient version of a modular arithmetic problem possible so that only you and the person who know your key will be able to solve your problem. All right. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, these are my references. Again, this is the article by Lin, um, who basically writes an article on the Chinese Remitted Theorem. Uh, and it was posted on the Stanford University website. So um, feel free to check this out if you want to learn more. Um, with that said, I think we're about done. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm.